Today we're tackling one of the most popular system design interview questions, how to design Google Drive. This is a fantastic question because it covers file storage, synchronization, scalability, and many other critical concepts. Welcome back to Try Accept. My name is Sean. First things first, we need to understand what we're building. We need to define the scope and requirements. To do this, we will split our requirements into functional and non-functional. The first functional requirement is to add files. Users can both upload or create new files. Both of these will fall under the umbrella of add files. Second, the system will sync files across multiple devices. If a user uploads a file on their computer, it will also be available on their phone. Third, files will be versioned. Users can track and see the various file versions and edits. Now for the non-functional requirements. First, the system must be reliable. The architecture must eliminate the possibility of data loss. Next, the system must have a fast sync speed. When a file is edited, that must immediately sync with the cloud. If a user becomes impatient, they will abandon the product. Third, the application must be scalable and handle high volumes of traffic. Finally, the system must have high availability. The system should have maximal uptime and users must always be able to access their files. Before we move on, I understand these are just a subset of Google Drive's features, but they are the core features which we are concerned with today. So we need to define the load this system needs to handle. Let's do some basic estimations. We will assume the application has 50 million signed up users and 10 million daily active users. Each user will receive 10 gigabytes of space. Assume each user uploads on average two files a day of 500 kilobytes in size. There is a one-to-one -one read to write ratio. The total disk space required will be 500 petabytes. That is 10 gigabytes times 50 million users. The queries per second for upload is roughly 240. We expect the peak queries per second to be 480. Here is the high level target architecture built to handle the estimated load. At this very high level, it does not look terribly complex, but each section has its own unique requirements, which we'll go through one by one. So you can better understand this architecture. We will start from scratch with a single server that can handle most of the required features. We will then decouple and scale each feature to handle millions of users. This single server will have three API endpoints that cover three functional requirements to upload a file, to download a file, and to retrieve file versions. All three endpoints will be built into a single fast API instance. First, upload a file. Two types of upload are supported. Simple upload, which is utilized when file sizes are small, and resumable upload, which is used when file sizes are large and network interruptions are possible. This API will be available at the endpoint upload. A URL parameter is used to indicate the upload type. So for example, upload, upload type equals resumable. To upload the file via an API, the body content type will be multi-part form data. The parameter data will contain the file. A resumable upload will be handled by the client. The client will monitor the upload and if it is interrupted, it will resume the upload. To download a file from the server, the client will make a request to download with the parameter path. Path is the directory of the file the client is requesting. To get file revisions, the client will make a request to list revisions. It will have two parameters, path and limit. Path refers to the file and limit refers to the maximum number of revisions the system is to return. Similar endpoints will be developed for sharing and editing files. Utilizing the server's file management system, we will develop a storage for Google Drive. The parent directory will be named drive. Each user will receive a directory with their user ID. So let's just say user one, user two, and user three. Within each of these directories, all the user's files will be kept. These files can be of any type. A metadata database is required to keep track of user activity and file revisions. 
When deciding on a database type, we need to consider the paradigms it needs to follow and its requirements. In this system, it is unacceptable for a file to be shown differently to different clients at the same time. If a user views a file on their phone, it must be the same on their computer. This is one of the non-functional requirements. In database terms, the system needs to provide strong consistency for the metadata it stores. To achieve strong consistency, a database which follows ACID properties is optimal. That is, atomicity, consistency, isolation, and durability. Relational databases follow these properties. As a result, Postgres is implemented in this architecture. Let's take a quick look at the database schema. It will have six tables. User. The user table contains basic information about each user such as email, username and last login. The device table, which contains all information relating to users' devices. Workspace. A workspace defines the access to a file or to a group of files. The file table stores everything relating to the most recent version of a file. File version stores data relating to a specific version of a file. One file can have many versions. Block. This will become important later, but it stores everything relating to a file block. Each file will be split into blocks, and to reconstruct the file, we need to know which blocks belong to that file. Now, the architecture needs to be scaled to support the non-functional requirements and the rough estimation of 50 million users. The first thing we need to scale is the file management system. To do this, the architecture will use an object storage service. If the architecture is based on AWS, this service would be S3 buckets. The Azure option is blob storage. In very simple terms, object storage services are file management systems similar to the one on our server, except hosted in the cloud. These services are hosted in various regions. These regions are data centers placed throughout the world such as AWS having data centers in Ireland and also Virginia. All these data centers combined are referred to as the cloud. A significant benefit of these object storage services is their ability to replicate across and within regions. So a single S3 bucket can be replicated in Ireland and Virginia, ensuring there is little to no data loss, meeting one of our non-functional requirements. To scale the architecture even more, the metadata database will be removed from the single server and placed in the cloud. The architecture already utilizes Postgres. Both AWS and Azure offer managed Postgres services. Simply placing a single database in the cloud will not scale. Instead, the database needs to be replicated and sharded in order to meet demand. Sharding is a technique that distributes data across multiple database instances. Finally, the API itself needs to be removed from the server and scaled. Each endpoint could receive its own Fast API instance and act as a unique microservice. The Fast API applications will be deployed on an AWS EC2 instance or Azure's virtual machines. This will also be horizontally scaled, so multiple Fast API instances will be running concurrently. To manage the load across these Fast API instances, a load balancer will be placed in front of them. The architecture is now completely decoupled from the original server. However, there is one more problem we need to solve. Large files are computationally expensive to upload and download. They also take a long time to send on the wire. To solve this, we will implement block storage. Block storage is the process of splitting a larger file into multiple equal parts called blocks and storing them individually. When a client requests the large file, the blocks will be stitched back together and sent to the client. When the client alters a section of that file, only the section's block gets updated. This reduces the computational complexity of all operations on that file. It also means just the edited block needs to be sent on the wire. This improves scalability. Earlier, we saw the metadata database schema. In that schema, the block table supports this addition. To implement block storage, we will utilize AWS EBS which will split the files into blocks and store frequently used blocks 
in memory. EBS will sync with S3 buckets, which will be utilized for long-term storage. Okay, so here's the request flow for uploading a file. The client will make a request to upload endpoint containing that file. The request will be passed to the load balancer, which will then forward it to a fast API instance. The fast API instance will calculate the size of the file. If it's large enough, it will be sent to the block servers. In our case, it is. The file is then split up and stored long term in S3 buckets. The fast API servers will also update the metadata database with the relevant information. To download a file, the client will make a request to download. The request will go through the load balancer and passed to a fast API instance. The API will query the database for that file's information, at which point it will find out the relevant blocks that make up the file. It will then query EBS for all the blocks and send them back to the client. Okay, so that's it from me at TryAccept. Go to tryaccept.io to support the channel. Your homework today is to explain how you would support multiple users editing the same file at the same time. Let's just discuss it in terms of algorithms. Your clue is that a LIFO algorithm will not work.